Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you everyone for coming today. Good morning and welcome to the Grah Pemuda, the activity center for the Islamic Renaissance Front. Um, we are very honored and thankful for Professor Sefai Aratas today to join us to discuss about the Ibn Khaldun lesson to contemporary Malay society. So without further ado, I invite Professor Farid. Thank you, Shahid. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, first of all, thanks to IRF for the invitation to uh, discuss my uh, work on Ibn Khaldun. Um, I think the best way to, to begin is to, to say that um, in this part of the world, in the Malay world or in the Santara, we may not really understand the relevance of Ibn Khaldun because most people think of Ibn Khaldun as a scholar of the Arab world, of North Africa, uh, of a society which is uh, tribal, um, uh, which is nomadic. Right? So you think of uh, nomadic tribes in the desert and you think of um, states formed based on the interaction between uh, nomadic society and uh, uh, sedentary or settled societies, you know, the, the, the classic um, relationship between um, Badawi and Hadari society, which Ibn Khaldun talks about. So a lot of people think, well, that's nothing to do with the Malay world, right? It's, um, uh, it's an entirely different uh, um, political economy, an entirely different uh, eco ecological system. So what, is, what has it to do with us? So I'd like to really focus, um, and that's what I do in my, my two books. In my two books on Ibn Khaldun, I, uh, I talk about his life and his thought, and I also talk about uh, applications of his, um, uh, his perspectives on state, on society, to um, uh, not only the pre-modern world, but also the, uh, the modern world. Uh, but uh, this morning, I think I want to, to, to deal specifically with um, the relevance of Ibn Khaldun to us uh, in the contemporary world and also to, um, to the Malay world. So maybe the first thing to, uh, to say is that Ibn Khaldun um, is asking us to think about history and about um, our society in what today we would call a sociological way. Um, and in, in this sense, he's criticizing the methodology of the Hadith scholars. Um, uh, he's not criticizing the methodology of the Hadith scholars for, um, for the study of Hadith but he's criticizing the methodology of the Hadith scholars for the study of history. Because in, in the past, um, in his time and before his time, the, when scholars were studying history, to assess whether a, uh, a fact that is reported by a historian is uh, correct, they'll use the methodology of, uh, of the Hadith scholars. In other words, they'll check the isna, they'll check the chain of transmission, they'll check the reliability of the, the transmitter. Um, but Ibn Khaldun is saying that you, you can't go by that or you can't go by that alone because sometimes the reliability of the transmitter may not be in question but the facts reported are, um, do not accord with what we understand to be the nature of reality and therefore it's not possible that, or highly unlikely that, what was reported to have happened actually happened. Um, and in, in order to know what really happened, you must know something about the nature of society. So I, I'll just give a very specific example from Ibn Khaldun. He talks about the Idrisid dynasty. All right? uh, there's, a, there's a ruler by the name of Idris bin Idris bin Abdullah bin Hassan bin Al-Hassan bin Ali ibn Abi Talib. So this is a, a, a um, 
this Idris was a descendant of uh, Said Ali. Um, and he was the ruler of a dynasty called the Idrisids, the Idrisia in Morocco. So there was a rumor of, of gossip being spread that this Idris bin Idris, his father was Idris also, was not really bin Idris, but he was bin Rashid. <laughs> well, in, in other words, his, his, a man called Rashid had an adulterous relationship with uh, Idris bin Idris' uh, mother. So he's actually, his real biological father was Rashid. Right? And so this was a gossip or a rumor that had been circulating. Um, now, Ibn Khaldun said that if you know something about the society, about the life of people in those days in the desert, because at that time Idris bin Idris, you know, he was born in, uh, in a desert environment and grew up in a desert environment. Ibn Khaldun said that if you know something about the life of people in those areas, it's not possible for a couple to have an adulterous relationship without anyone knowing about it, right? And definitely, because you are living, you are not living in an urban area, uh, you know, with stone uh, housing and noise doesn't travel and uh, people cannot see the activities of your neighbor, you know. Um, whereas in the desert environment, it's a different uh, case. It's like imagine living in a in a in a kampong atmosphere where everybody knows that people know what you're cooking. They know what you're having for breakfast, they know what you're having for dinner. So it's very hard for uh, adultery to take place without the whole community knowing. And if the whole, if, if adultery did take place and it, and it was known by the people there that Idris bin Idris was the product of an adulterous relationship, then he would not be supported by his people. It would be known. So, so this is what I mean, you know. Uh, knowing something about the nature of the society will tell you whether something reported as a fact was possible or not. You understand? Um, so Ibn Khaldun said, you cannot rely on transmission, the transmitter or the reliability of the transmitter alone. You have to look at whether the fact that is reported could possibly have happened or not. Uh, the term he uses is istihalat in Arabic, which, which uh, is related to it means impossibility. In Malay, we say mustahil. Right? It's the same. Uh, it comes from the same root. So that's what we mean by looking at the uh, thinking sociologically. Meaning, you look at the nature of society, and then you are in a position to to say. Uh, something about whether the facts, the reported facts, could have happened. Uh, to give another example unrelated to Ibn Khaldun, uh, talking about the Islamization of the Malay world, the, um, uh, it, it has often been said by scholars that Islam came from Persia, Islam came from, uh, from India, uh, Islam came from China, sometimes they say it came from, from Turkey. Um, it's possible that that there was some Islamic influence from these various places, but it's not possible that the dominant influence in Islam came from these places. And we know that, even if we don't have the, the uh, facts, but we can assume that, um, for example, Turkey or China a lot of people have been saying that China played a very important role in Islamization. It's not possible. Because the Chinese Muslims are Hanafis, generally. And we are Shafi'is. If the Chinese Muslims played a dominant role in Islamization, then, then the Malays would be Hanafis. Right? So if you know something about, again, the nature of society, uh, in, in this case, when Muslims engage in Islamization, obviously they don't. Uh, convert non-Muslims to a madhab that is different from their own. Why would the Hanafis bring Shafi'i Islam to the Malays? Right? Why would the Shafi'is bring a Hanafi or Maliki Islam to another uh, uh, group of converts? So you need to, we need to know something about the nature of society, in this case the nature of conversion, how conversion happens, 
um, what is the significance of the the madhabs in Islam to, to make some uh, learned conjecture about what the source of Islam is. So clearly in the case of the Malay world, the source of Islam, the dominant source, has to be Shafi'i areas. right? Um, and the Shafi'i areas that um, are important for us would be <coughs> the southern part of India, uh, <coughs> Tamil Nadu, but more specifically uh, Kerala, uh, and um, to some extent Gujarat, and also uh, the Hadramaut. Hadramaut, of course, is the most important source uh, because they are the only, practically the only Shafi'is who also traveled uh, on a large scale uh, the maritime routes uh, to East Africa, to South India, and to Southeast Asia. So you can't simply rely on text and on transmission. You, you have to have a kind of logic, but this logic is a sociological logic. It's knowing something about society. So this is the, I think, the, the main principle of Ibn Khaldun's uh, science of society. He called it Ilm al Ijtima al Insani, uh, the science of human society. This is the main principle. Um, so um, he developed this uh, science because he said that you can't rely on the methodology of the Hadith scholars to verify the reports of history, of the historians. You need to understand something about the nature of society. And in his own uh, research, he went into the study of the rise and decline of dynasties. Right? Um, so uh, I think it's important to, to, uh, to understand that we can, we can look at Ibn Khaldun at two levels. At one level, he's talking about the rise and decline of dynasties, a specific theory of state formation. But at a more abstract theoretical level, he's talking about a certain type of analysis, a soci what we would, today we would call a sociological mode of analysis, looking at the nature of society and the essence of society. And by understanding the essence of society, you can make a distinction between uh, um, khabar, facts or reports that are true and false. For example, if you know something about the nature of desert life, you know, how people in the desert live, their social uh, life, their social interaction, their conditions of living, if you know something about that, then you can judge whether the rumor about Idris bin Idris being uh, an illegitimate child was true or not. All right. So, um, so if we look at Ibn Khaldun at these two levels, the, the more abstract level, it's about uh, thinking about the nature of society, um, and then using our understanding about the nature of society to um, distinguish between truth and uh, falsehood in history. And then we also look at Ibn Khaldun in terms of his theory of state formation. Both are relevant to the modern world today. So let me just say a few words uh, about that. So the first issue, um, thinking sociologically about the nature of society. Um, I would like to give an, an example of the application of that to um, understanding extremism in the Muslim world today. And I want to uh, uh, refer to one aspect of extremism, because extremism means many things. You know, when we say extremism, we could mean uh, literalism, literal interpretations of uh, religious texts. Um, when we say extremism, we could also um, mean uh, legalism. That means one-sided emphasis on legal aspects of religion, uh, on rituals, for example, and not enough emphasis on uh, sp uh, spirituality. Um, when we say extremism, we, we may also refer to exclusivism, where you know you, in various ways, you exclude one community, uh, you, you exclude one, uh, so the Muslim community, for example. Uh, you refer to them as uh, as um, non-Muslims, or you refer to them as uh, deviant, 
or it could refer to a certain exclusivist attitude towards uh, non-Muslims, uh, like Jews and Christians and Hindus, uh, where you exclude them from certain aspects of uh, social and political life on the grounds that they are not Muslims, exclusivism. So I want to talk about exclusivism. And you know, in the, in the Muslim world today, we have uh, a, um, a very exclusivist, um, um, xenophobic attitude towards Jews. Um, <clears throat> of course, there are so many reasons for our uh, prejudicial attitude towards Jews. Uh, we tend not to make a distinction between uh, Zionist ideology, which itself um, has been exclusivist against uh, Palestinians. Um, we tend not to make a distinction. Many Muslims don't make a distinction between being Zionist and being Jewish. Now, uh, and there are many reasons for that. It has to do with the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, it has to do with um, uh, the perception that uh, the U.S. has a biased support, uh, has a support for Israel that is sort of uh, uh, imbalanced. Its, its policies in the Middle East are not balanced. Um, but part of the reason that we have prejudiced views towards um, Jews is because uh, there is um, a, a story in Islamic tradition, which I regard as um, um, partly mythical, that the Prophet agreed to the mass killing as a punishment of 600 to 900 Jewish men from a tribe, a Jewish tribe called the Bani Qurayda in Medina. I think you, some of you have, you have heard of this, right? And this story has been, uh, it's found in the major hit works of history of the Muslims um, from the earliest days and has been handed down from generation to generation and is um, believed in by most Muslims, whether Sunni or, or Shiite. Um, now the, the reason why we have doubt to believe this story, according to the story, I can't go into all the details, but... This the, is in a hadith, is it, this story? It's not in a hadith. Uh, it's a historical... It's, it's in the seerah, the, the life uh, story of the Prophet. And one of the problems is that the, the original source itself is not based on uh, uh, you know, uh, a reliable train mm -hmm. of uh, transmission. But yet, it has been handed down from generation to generation. Um, so the story is that during the battle of the um, trench, Khanda, Medina, um, the, 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 uh, the people of the Quraysh who were not Muslims, who had not yet become Muslims, came from Mecca to confront the Prophet, to fight against the Prophet, and uh, the uh, Prophet had already migrated to Medina. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, the Muhajir and you know, the migrants to Medina and the Ansar, the Medinans who are helping the uh, the, the Muslims, uh, they were self, of course they became Muslims themselves, uh, um, were being uh, confronted by the, the Quraysh. Um, in the end, there was no battle because the, the Muslims, the Prophet um, and his companions built a trench uh, which prevented the, the, the Quraysh from uh, crossing over and engaging in battle. So that's why it's called the Battle of the Trench, but there was actually no battle. Um, now, prior to that, the Prophet made an agreement with the tribes of, the Jewish tribes of Medina, that uh, they would live as part of uh, the community, as part of the Ummah, uh, alongside Muslims, and be protected by the, the Muslim rulers of Medina on the condition that they would not take sides with the enemies of the Muslims. This is the famous Sahifa, the people call it the Charter or the Constitution of Medina, right? It's called the Sahifa. A series of agreements that the Prophet made with the Jews of Medina. Um, but during, uh, during, after the, uh, the, the so-called Battle of Khandaq was over, uh, the Prophet, according to the story, was 
told or was informed that the Bani Qurayza were had been planning to fight with the Quraysh against the Muslims. Now, in, in the story itself, it's not clear whether there actually was fighting going on. Whether any, um, it, it's possible that some, there was some fighting and there was some deaths. Um, but the numbers and how many, we don't know. Uh, that's not reported in the story. But to make a long story short, and it is quite a long story actually, uh, the Prophet, um, after a series of negotiations um, and discussions, it was agreed um, between the Muslims and the Jews of Bani Qurayza that all their men would be killed and their women and uh, children be sold as slaves. Right? So it seems like it's collective punishment. We know for certain that not all these men had fought against Muslims. We don't even know whether there was any fighting to begin with, right? But it must be the case that some of them did because the Quran mentions, I forget which ayat, but it mentions, it doesn't mention Bani Qurayza, but most of the inter interpreters, uh, most of the, what do you call it, the um, uh, commentators say that that verse refers to the, the Bani Qurayza. So, therefore, there had, had to have been some conflict, but certainly not, 600, not hundreds of uh, Jewish uh, men from the Bani Qurayza fought against Muslims. Um, but nevertheless, they were all killed, and their wives and daughter, uh, children sold as slaves, according to the story. All right. Now, apart from the fact that the chain of transmission is weak, there's one source. Um, we, ask to have, we have to ask ourselves this question. Is it possible that that could have happened? Now initially my feeling was that could the Prophet have been so harsh and uh, apply collective punishment for the crimes of possibly a few Jewish men? That has never been the norm in, uh, in Islam, in Islamic uh, jurisprudence. That has never been the uh, uh, that being the case, right? Um, so how could the Prophet have, uh, uh, how could he have done this? So then I began to think about um, the logic of what was reported in the standard account. So according to the standard account, the, now when you look at the standard account, you see that things did not happen, if you believe the, that account, it did not happen according to uh, what you would think would happen logically in such situation. So according to the account, the, the Bani Qurayda lived some, uh, you know, I don't remember, but it's some hours by, by uh, foot from Medina. They were brought to Medina, um, to the town itself, and held there. Now that already seems quite illogical. Why would the Muslims go to the, the, the area of the Bani Qurayza and then bring them to Medina and hold them there? We're talking about six to nine hundred men plus their families. That means, let's say six hundred, and let's say there are one Jewish man, each family is a man and a woman and, and three children, let's say. Probably more than three children, but let's say five of them. Five times six is 3,000, at least 3,000 people. Why would the Muslims go to the uh, uh, dwellings of the Bani Qurayza by foot some hours away from Medina and then bring them back to Medina and hold them there? And how, how do you do that with 3,000 people? Um, it would make more sense if they simply went to them in, uh, um, you know, just outside Medina and, and uh, hold them there and then deal with what you want to do with them there, right? Um, and according to the story, these 3,000 people were brought to Medina and held in the house of a, a Muslim uh, lady. That also is very suspicious because we don't really know whether there's such a big house. 
I mean, a house, even in today's condition, uh, a house that can hold 3,000 uh, people, right? Um, that should have been a very famous house in Medina. It would have been the largest uh, house, like a palace. But we have no record of such uh, a house. Um, also, according to the story, none, not a single person from the Bani Quraida tried to escape while being brought from uh, outside to Medina. Not a single one tried to escape. And in Medina, when they were held in the house, none of them tried to escape. Um, then there was negotiation going on. The Prophet appointed uh, uh, one of the Sahaba, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, to, ne uh, to negotiate. Um, and at the end, the decision was, again, this is very strange, because the Jews agreed that they would all be killed and their wives and children sold as slaves. No objection. Not a single Jew of the Bani Quraida said that we'll convert to Islam to escape the punishment. Because this has happened in the past. That you have this common, you know, to convert to Islam. Not a single one of them did that. Doesn't make sense. Um, but then, if, if it is said that, well, they, they didn't convert to Islam because they are good Jews, they are loyal to their religion. But that doesn't make sense either because if they were good, really good Jews, they would not have broken their pro uh, promise with the Prophet to begin with. Right? Um, then, according to the story, uh, uh, so, you know, just to, uh, to, to go back to the issue of thinking sociologically, um, we know the the, the situation of Jews among the Muslims in Arabia, where there were Jewish tribes or Jewish individuals who were problematic individuals who, in the sense that they um, broke rules, they broke, broke uh, laws, uh, they went against uh, agreements that they made with Muslims. Um, um, and in, we, we know that there are circumstances in which they would convert to Islam to es escape punishment, that this was a way out. So this happened. So it's strange that it didn't happen when these Jewish men um, assuming that they were the kind of people who broke the agreement and therefore not men of high moral character, it's strange that they would not have converted to save their, their lives. Right? Um, so that shows that there's a hole in the, in the story. Then according to the story, these men, 600 to 900 of them, were killed by uh, Sayyidina Ali and uh, Zubair. Zubair was Sahaba. Um, they were beheaded in the matter of a few hours, I think, throughout the, the night. Again, this is very suspicious because it's not easy to behead 600 men with the sword. I don't think it can be done in a few hours. Um, nobody knows anything about the graves of these 600 men. Where are they buried? Surely, they would have been buried there, in Medina. They, I mean, they would not have been, who was going to, who would take all their bodies elsewhere and bury them elsewhere. And we have no information about their graves. Sayyidina Ali, in, the, in his khutbas and letters and his sayings, always mentioned his battles and his fighting, his, 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 you know, his, his, his um, uh, fightings with you know, different uh, individuals and groups, but he never mentioned one word about the killing of the men of the Bani Quraida. So there are so many things in the story that if we understand the nature of reality, we will see that it's unlikely that these things happen. So applying Ibn Khaldun's uh, logic, we can see that um, the story, apart from the fact that it has a weak chain of transmission, uh, it, it's also sociologically uh, um, you know, uh, illogical. Right? It, it, it's unlikely that it could happen the way it was reported. So as I said, it's possible that there were some men of the Bani Quraida who were uh, killed, uh, who fought against the Muslims, and it's possible that they were punished and, and maybe even executed. But the whole tribe killed 
and they accepted the verdict for them to be killed, and they accepted that their wives and children would be sold. Um, in other words, collect, they accepted that collective punishment seems to go against the character of the Prophet, um, and it goes against what we know of, uh, of uh, human nature. Why would the, the men of Bani Qurayda, why would they accept such a punishment and just you know, passively uh, go through the, the, the punishment? Um, because we as Muslims have accepted this story unquestioningly, it, in a sense, reinforces our stereotype about the Jews. If the Prophet could do that, they must have been terrible people. If the Prophet could, could uh, mete out such a harsh punishment on these men, all of the, the entire Jewish tribe, he, he killed all of the men and sold their wives and children as slaves. If the Prophet could do such a harsh thing, they must have, because the Prophet is a good man, we say. It means those Jews must have been very bad people. The whole tribe were bad people. So um, that reinforces our stereotypes about Jews. And it indeed has been used uh, by Muslims. One, uh, I think it was a Russian member of Al-Qaeda a few years ago, actually used the Bani Khuraida and said, why are the, uh, the Christians or the Europeans uh, or, 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 he, uh, he said, well, no, why are people uh, saying that we are cruel when we are killing Christians? He said that. He said, our prophet killed all these Jews because they weren't good people. So why are we so, you know, uh, uh, so much against, uh, why are people so much against what Al-Qaeda is doing? Why are Muslims against what Al-Qaeda is doing? So you see, if these stories go on, these stories which are actually myths, if they are handed down from generation to generation and they are not challenged, they, uh, they contribute to uh, the uh, development uh, and the persistence of stereotypes. Um, there is another myth which I won't go into, I won't go into the details, but this is the myth of Abdullah ibn Sabah, a Yemeni Jew, again this is in our history, Yemeni Jew who single-handedly created Shi'ism and was able to fool the, the, the early Muslim community, um, uh, was apparently able to fool was apparently able to fool the early uh, imams of the Shiites, such as Imam Jafar Sadiq and so on and so forth, um, who all accepted this new religion, Twelver Shi'ism, you know, Ifna Shari. Shi'ism, they accepted it, uh, and um, <coughs> and that uh, this Shi'ism has gone on for you know more than uh, 1,400 years, and uh, so we you know we we are all we have all been fooled by one uh, by one man, again. Um, so th th this this uh, myth is uh, circulated. Uh, by sectarianists, anti-Shiite sectarianists. Um, the serious scholars of Islam, among the Sunnis, don't accept that Abdullah ibn Sabah uh, did that. There's even doubt among the Muslim scholars whether he actually existed. But those who say that he existed, among the Sunni scholars, say that he had created a deviant sect called the Sabaiyah. They don't accept the idea that he created Twelve uh, Shi'ism, which they regard as a legitimate sect in, in Islam. Um, but my point is this: again, if you apply the logic of Ibn Khaldun, it's not possible. The Muslims are very uh, prone to accepting uh, conspiracy theories. Um, but the nature of things is such that it's not possible for a man who lived in the time of Sayyidina Ali, Abdullah ibn Sabah, if, if it is true that he existed, it's not possible uh, for him single-handedly to create a religion and for everybody around him to be fooled to the extent where that religion takes root and is, uh, uh, you know, uh, people are socialized into it and it becomes a, uh, a major sect within Islam professed by, what, 20% of the, of the Muslim, entire, entire Muslim population. That just doesn't uh, happen 
in any society. Right? But if you don't understand that, then you, you may easily accept this, this myths. Um, so, so these are two examples, the myth of the Bani Quraida, the myth of the massacre of Bani Quraida, and the myth of Abdullah ibn Sabah. We apply Ibn Khaldun's logic of istihala, right? of, of making a distinction between uh, uh, the imkan, imkan, you know, like a munkin possibility, the imkan and the istihala, the possibility and impossibility of, uh, of report of um, what was reported. Uh, then we will be able to have a more critical attitude towards uh, uh, information, uh, historical information, or any other kind of information that we that we receive. Okay, so I'll just um, maybe say a few more words, yeah. okay, um, about the the application of Ibn Khaldun, not his general principles of understanding the nature of society, but now more specifically his theory of state formation, the relationship between um, uh, nomadic and sedentary societies. Um, I won't again go into all the details, but basically Ibn Khaldun was talking about states which, in which dynasties were formed based on the military support provided by nomadic tribes. And it, the, the idea was that nomadic tribes living in, living in the deserts, because of the, the, the life style, simple lifestyle, um, dependent on uh, uh, always traveling on horseback, uh, and therefore being very skilled horsemen, um, and having a desert lifestyle in which they, they were stronger, they were physically fit, and also and this is very important, there was a strong sense of uh, solidarity. They were all related to each other, right? They were all related by blood, um, and they lived close together, so they had a strong sense of solidarity. So they, they constituted a stronger military force than people in the cities. People in the cities, after, because they, you know, many, many groups live in the cities, they're not all related to each other, so therefore the blood ties are not there. And city life is more luxurious, um, so people tend to be less physic physically less uh, strong, and um, uh, also less used to riding on horseback because you know city life is different. So, for all these reasons, the, the nomadic tribes were superior in terms of physical strength and military prowess. Um, so they often provided the military support for a new dynasty to conquer uh, a, a state. Um, so the main distinction, uh, when you look at the entire society in Ibn Khaldun, is between what he calls Badawi and Hadari. Badawi is nomadic, mainly living in the deserts, and Hadari means sedentary, meaning living in villages and towns. All right. Now, when we come to the Malay world, do we have that distinction? Kampung Bandar. <laughs> okay, actually it's not Kampung Bandar because you see town and country, town and village is, uh, we have that. But it's sedentary. But because we think both are sedentary. Yeah. Both are sedentary. And now the thing, problem is when we think in a Eurocentric way, in Europe the main distinction is for in European history is between town and country. Right? But in the Malay world, you have Hulu and Hilir. And more importantly, you have Orang Darat and Orang Laut. Mm. The Orang Laut are actually sea nomads. Maybe not today, but for hundreds of years, for, for centuries, they were living on the sea and they were moving around. Right? And not only that, they played a very similar role that the desert nomads played in, uh, uh, in the Middle East, or in North Africa, or in China, among the Mong Mongols. Um, in the Malacca Sultanate, for example, the Orang Laut provided the military support to the, the sultans. Um, the sultans 
dependent on them, de dependent on them, depended on them for military support, for security, for policing the the the, the Straits of Malacca. Um, so they were very integral part of uh, of the Sultanate. But the problem is, our uh, when we when we uh, think about the history of uh, the Malay world, we think about the history of Malacca, for example. We, we, we think of this history in a land-centric manner. The, the sea is there just to travel from one land, one piece of land to another. Right? We don't look at the sea as an economy unto itself. So the whole society, Malacca society, when we think of Malacca society, we think of the land. So the sea is just where you go because you want to travel by, by ship to go somewhere else. But actually, the whole the society includes the, the sea. Orang Laut are as important as Orang Darat. And the, the, the society living on land cannot exist without the sea. Because the Orang Laut are an integral part of, uh, of the entire society. Right? So, um, so the relationship between Orang Laut and Orang Darat is similar to the relationship between uh, uh, Umran Hadari and Umran Badawi in, in Ibn Khaldun. So I think it's possible to talk about the history of Malacca political economy or Malacca society using uh, the Khaldunian model. And not only, of course, Malacca, the entire, you know, um, many parts of the Malay world, the history of Kedah, because Kedah um, um, for, for, um, for centuries, uh, relied on Orang Laut also. Yeah? Um, in fact, um, I think it has been pointed out by historians that Kedah is the longest um, uh, longest dynasty in the world because it's the dynasty that uh, has survived for a thousand years. There's no other dynasty that has survived so long. The Ottomans were about 700 years. Um, that's quite interesting. Uh, but many parts of the Malay world, the, the Orang Laut were an integral part of society. Right? So we ought, ought not to be land-centric. You know? the, the sea is just a place to travel, you know? uh, to, to traverse from one land to a, another. But the sea for centuries in the Malay world was a political economy unto itself, which has an integral relationship with, uh, with the land. Um, so that's another example of how Ibn Khaldun is, uh, is relevant. So uh, just to end, when we think about applying Ibn Khaldun, we have to think of it at different levels of abstraction. Um, at a more empirical level, his theory is about the uh, relationship between nomadic and sedentary societies. It's about state formation. Uh, and we can uh, apply his uh, ideas to um, history, to dynasties of the past. Some of the dynasties today, the Saud dynasty, the, uh, the um, Assad dynasty in Syria, um, politics in Yemen, um, I think they, these are cases to which Ibn Khaldun can be applied. Um, and then societies outside of Ibn Khaldun's own society, like the Malay world, we can also apply his, uh, his theory. But at a more abstract level, not talking about state formation, but talking about thinking sociologically, uh, that I think has even wider uh, application. There are so many cases, um, uh, and I gave two examples, the, the myth of Ab Abdullah ibn Sabah and the, the myth of the massacre of the Bani Qurayda, um, where we can think in a Khaldunian way uh, to have a more critical approach to um, uh, what is handed down to us as, uh, as facts. Thank you very much.